Thanks, Nat. Go ahead. All right. Welcome to meeting number 3,764 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Now, we have two basic guiding rules or policies at the college, the first of which is one full at a time, and the second one are no personal attacks. Now, the basic format that we follow are a special guest speaker presentation, followed by a question period. The third part is which the microphone is open to everyone to make remarks and rebuttals. And the concluding part of the program are the speaker's final comments. Now, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our eight upcoming programs. On April the 27th, we will continue our special Earth Day series of speakers featuring uh, Janet Gitzler, longtime college regular, uh, who's going to be talking about how to kick, kick the plastic habit, how to go without plastic uh, in your daily life activities. On May the 4th, we will have our special May Day speaker, Joe Kopsick, political analyst and college regular, will be talking about why the market isn't free, the rigged economy, and why we should repeal the Taft-Hartley Act. So all about labor law. On May the 11th, author D and activist D.C. Knight will be returning to present his latest edition of his book, A Realistic Path to Peace, How We Can Stop It, Global War. Um, following that, on May the 18th, we'll be looking at nuclear energy, specifically transporting it. We're having representatives of two organizations uh, making presentations. On May the, that's on May the 18th. On May the 25th, we'll be looking at a plot, a conspiratorial plot to steal the presidential election by denying people's voting rights. Very important program. On June the 1st, a young man, Tom O'Donnell, asked the question that life is not financially fair and he can't figure out why. Why is there socioeconomic disparities in our country? On June the 8th, the Migratory Bird Society will be telling us about their activities to ensure the migratory paths of birds. And on June the 15th, um, Harold Sid Cohen will be talking about Marxism, specifically dialectic materialism, which he says is an accurate description of our economic system. Okay, that's all for, and the next open dates are June 22nd and 29th. Okay, Tim, take it away. All right, uh, if you're up there, I'd like to introduce, uh, I forget, I'm sorry, forget your name. Anna Schiefelbein. Anna Schiefelbein. From the green, okay. Just go ahead and start your uh, lecture. We'll welcome us, there'll be a few more coming in. So I'm trying to still get your PowerPoint restarted here real quick. So bear with me while I get it running here. Um, ILGP basic, okay, it's coming up now. Really. So we'll have it ready in a second. If you need to move around and take a look at the screen, just take the mic with you. We can follow you with the camera if you need to. That's fine, I can stay up there. Okay, just, uh, it's coming up now, so just, uh, We'll be stopping these technical issues in about three or four weeks when my text check comes in. I'm probably going to get a new laptop.
Okay, here we go. Yeah, you'll have new tech issues and getting it. Oh, getting sure. It <laughs> I'm sure we will, but this one's running Windows 7. So but let me uh, get the, the zoom in here. Share the screen and we'll get ready to go. Hang on a second. Get a slideshow from beginning. Full screen. Let me get the damn zoom up now. Share screen. PowerPoint. Okay, I think we got it. All right, can everybody see that? Can everybody see that uh, PowerPoint on the screen there, Charlie? Yeah. And you could see a short little thing of her, correct? Yeah. Okay, good. So everything's working fine. All right, well, we're uh, ready for your presentation, so. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Charles, for inviting me as well, and the Illinois Green Party. Um, I know that this audience has had the Illinois Green Party um, and its members here a few times. Um, so, but I just wanted to first um, uh, give a little detail about who we are. Um, if you want to flip the slide. Um, so no corporate money in politics. So what really makes us different from other parties is that we don't want corporate contributions in politics. Um, currently, there are corporate contributions or corporate tax contributions. Uh, corporate power of the people should not be in a corporate war party. It does not belong there. Nor should the power of the people be in the corporate war party. Um, do you want to flip? So I know that there uh, people here have probably seen these ten key values before. Um, just quickly go through them. Um, now for these ten key values, every Green Party member um, in the U.S. and in the seventy-two plus countries all abide by these ten key values. Um, so, really quickly, ecological wisdom, social justice, grassroots democracy, nonviolence, decentralization, community based economics, feminism, respect for diversity, personal and global responsibility, and future focus. So, like I said, all Green Party members abide by these 10 key values across the US and in 72 plus countries. So more about the Green Party. Thanks, Tim. Mm -hmm. So the Illinois Green Party, I'm so proud that we get to be a diverse group within these 10 key values. Um, we're, we are uh, individuals. We do not receive or accept corporate donations or contributions. Um, and our goal is to advance the 10 key values in our political and social lives. Um, the Illinois Green Party, as we refer to the ILGP, we're both a political party, we can get on the ballot, and we're a membership organization, so we are a dues-paying organization as well. It's a way for us to uh, fundraise and keep the resources, uh, uh, keep the lights on and get us on the resources that we need to help do what we do, which is help build the power of the people. Um, we do have uh, the Global Green Greens. Um, they are in 72 plus countries around the world. Um, I'm not sure if there's any other parties that are in that many countries. Um, that would be interesting to look at. Um, if you want to flip one more. So the Illinois Green Party, we promote communications for local groups. And so what we do is we help develop uh, and give guidelines for community groups. Um, uh, for how they can do their decision-making process, how they can uh, use consensus for those decision-making. We provide uh, a respectful place for people to organize around issues. Um, and uh, we also have uh, a, a great space for of respect for diversity. So we're not all the same. We come from different demographics. We come from different socio socioeconomic classes. 
And we also have uh, freedom of religion, um, and we also uh, have individual rights um, that we all share in common, but we have it in such a space where everybody is respected. And so everybody is welcomed at the table. There's no pecking order. Um, you come in, you, what I say is you, what you get out of the Green Party is what you put in the Green Party. Um, so if you want to come in and be a podcast person, great. If you want to come in and be a phone banker, great. If you wanted to be an administrator, great. Um, we have volunteer opportunities for everybody. Um, and as long as it's within our green values, within the 10 key values, um, we will accept that. Um, want to flip? Yeah, I did. Yeah, we All right. So... Another thing that I'm proud of with the Illinois Green Party is we have the resources. We have website hosting, we have unlimited emails, we have donation and action sites with database, Zoom, Sign Now, StreamYard, our StreamYard sometimes we do a weekly podcast, we get between four and 7,000 um, views on a normal basis. Um, we're getting a social media support team forming. We also have website management coming down. Um, and we have guides and helpful tips and decades of experience from green, from green Illinois green members um, that have run local chapters in, in run issues. Um, so we do have some more information um, on how to build the power of the people in your community today. Um, and you can find resources at ilgp.org, and that's www.ilgp.org. Um, so I'm really proud that we have all these resources available. Um, I've been an activist for over 24 years, and it started with holding a sign and a weekly vigil, and now it's all about data migration, NDAs, and, <laughs> um, and uh, still holding a sign. So let's get involved. So help the Green Party resist the corporate two-party system. We have two corporate war parties, and we have then the Green Party, which I like to refer to as the Peace Party. There's several ways to uh, get involved. You can participate. You can volunteer. You can uh, start a new chapter in your local community. If, you, if there's already a chapter, you can help out. Um, you can run for office, you can donate. Um, these are all ways you can help out and resist the corporate party system. That's um, so one of the ways is through running for office and how for ballot access. Hi. Um, so party suppression is voter suppression. Um, Illinois is one of the hardest states for ballot access, not the hardest, it's one of the hardest. Please come sit down. Um, which is why it's very important for us to get on the ballot and give voters options. Hi, come sit. Now come on in and sit down, don't worry. Um, so we don't worry. I'm old now. College of complexes. <laughs> sit down and uh, join us. We're waving fees tonight, by the way, so okay. we're going to be waving the fruition tonight. Are you, are you on? Yes. Yeah. She is. Timmy, okay. Yeah. Nice to meet. I've been met. We talk. 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 We <laughs> no, she's, I'm here. she's giving her talk, and then we're going to have a question and answer period along with the rebuttal period. Well, I mean, I yeah, we got, some, we got some, some people I online too. We got some online too, so don't worry. And then at the end of the night, you get a chance to rebut too. So it's cold here. It'll warm up, trust me. And then the move will come. Table behind it or over here. All right. So where I um, I was in the ballot access. Yes. So we have the Green Party of the United States Ballot Access Committee, um, and we have plans to have ballot access in all fifty uh, U.S. states. Um, so um, right now in Illinois, did you? 
go ahead and put right there it is july 20. yeah so right now in illinois we are in our ballot access period um we go through june 24th and we have 25,000 signatures as a minimum to collect to get presidential uh candidate Joe Stein on the ballot. Our goal is 50, which is the maximum, so 50,000. And that drive is gonna happen through June 24th. Um, there you go. So right now we have uh, this G the Green Party of the United States ballot access nationwide. As you can see from this map, a lot of the uh, grayed out areas is still coming. Um, a lot of places are like us in Illinois where it's currently our petitioning period right now. Um, New York is probably, probably take, took the cake of having the hardest state. Um, I'd have to look at that, but um, they now switched it to they have to get 45,000 in 42 days or 42,000 in 45 days. I forgot which one it was, but there, this, is, this is not democracy. This is not democracy. And if I can just go back into Illinois, I mean, we are in a blue majority state. And some of our ballot access is shocks the conscience. It might be have being fair, but to me, it shocks the conscience. Um, Pre-COVID in Congressional District 1, I believe, um, in 2020, uh, the Democrats and Republicans needed maybe less than a couple hundred. 800. 800 um, in that district at that time, a new party would have needed 16,000. And why do we need 25? That's the minimum for a new party. Um, I think the Democrat, the corporate war parties needed about 10,000 uh, maximum. Uh, so the U.S. House represent of representatives uh, uh, districts really hurt us. Um, this last campaign season, they needed about generally less than a thousand for each Democrat and Republican um, district for new parties. For the rest. For the, for the U.S. House, I mean, yeah, for the U.S. Congressional yeah. House of Representatives. So they needed generally less than a thousand. Um, we need over 10 for new parties. For rest. For rest, yeah. And senators? Um, there's no senators this time around. The next senator race will be in 2026, I believe. No. Um, so that really hurts us. And I want to just remind people, this is in a blue majority state. They're so bad. They are so uh, let's, bad. Let's, uh, sorry, let's let our speaker continue. So let's uh, go to the next slide. Run for office. This is where it's key. So even if we can't get on the ballot, there's still a write-in strategy that can happen uh, for serious campaigners. Um, it's, it's a way to at least get something on the ballot, um, even though it's, it's not your name. Um, it's definitely a place where people can, you can campaign around, you can campaign around the fact of uh, these uh, signature requirements. Um, and uh, we want to be able to vote outside of the corporate part, war party. We're going to need people to step up, take the risk, and put their name out, out there. We cannot uh, vote for people. Okay, okay, let's, let's. Yeah, if that's what the person would like to do. Because we need, I mean, I personally, New, New Jersey is having all 13 districts for their congressional um, their congressional offices. They're just going to, every district has a Green Party candidate that they can choose. And they, they do any of them independent? Or, or I think they're all running as a Green Party. Let's let her finish her presentation and we'll go to questions. Yeah. Yeah. So the New Jersey people are lucky that they're going to have voter options. They're going to have a voter option in every congressional district uh, to pick a choice outside of the corporate war party. And so here in Illinois, I would love to see that too, but I would need people to step up to the plate. Uh, in order to get on the ballot, um, even as a write-in, um, to make sure that we have voter options. Because party suppression is voter suppression. We want to have voter options. We want to try to have uh, a democratic uh, uh, ballot. But 
with two parties only on there, two corporate parties, my definition of a wasted vote might be different than others of a wasted vote. Because my definition of a wasted vote is for a corporate war party. Yeah. So there are there it's really when you look at the, the races, there are there is there are races that are uncontested. Um, so the elected officials, when they win, they're really not going up against anybody. So it's not um, not really democracy because you only have the one choice. That's not a democracy. Next slide. But I wanted to say that you can help change that. You can help be a candidate, you can help run for office, and you can help give voters those options. Because um, without those options on the ballot, the corporate parties are going to already have one. And what we like to do is make sure that we have power of the people, and the power of the people is going to stay strong. But we need these people on the ballot in order for the voters to choose. Um, and by running for office, you can help keep democracy vibrant and competitive. So let's flip. He's already flipped. He's already gone. Volunteer opportunities. Right now we are in our ballot access mode. We have data entry administration, volunteer coordinators, phone banking, petitioners. So we are busy. Um, we also are always looking for local leaders and issue leaders as well. Our chapters are not just geographically based. But there can also be issue dates like healthcare for all. Um, we are all leaders. Um, I put in um, a little bit about Gaza here because that is a very important issue. Um, we all need to be united for a ceasefire in Palestine. We need a federal government devoted to meeting human needs, not just war. And if we all are all leaders, we all need to ensure good government, good governance happens in 2024, and not just the fight for a lesser of two evils. Okay, next. Next. It's just a fun little picture. I'm up there somewhere. They can see you. You can see you. I just wanted to show we're normal people. We're not, um, we're the Illinois Green Party. We like to have the professional left. Um, and we come from all walks of life. Um, we come from different backgrounds. We all like to abide by the 10 key values. And we have that respectful space where we can have a diversity of, uh, of ideology, of uh, religion. Everybody has the freedom of religion. We completely respect that. Individual rights, we completely respect that. And so I have uh, some additional resources if you want to flip. For people who love to read, I recommend the platform at ilgp.org slash platform. It is, it's actually, I printed it at once, 46 pages, single space. <laughs> you can also read it online, but just in, so in case anybody is printing that for one new, but it is good. It goes into all the issues, all the details. Um, so for people who want to read and learn more about the Green Party, that's a great way. We also have a membership um, uh, questions. Um, we also have that get involved link, um, and then our also our chapter link on it. You want to go one more? The time is now. It is 2024. It is the ballot petitioning season. It's, I know the candidate. I know the speaker last week was one of our candidates, and she emphasized water. I'm a mom and I have to emphasize water because I am scared for my children. I'm scared for my grandchildren. Um, so a long time away, but I'm so scared for the world that we are living in with scarcity of precious resources such as water and air. These are non-negotiable items. Um, so they're non-negotiable items. They are, we all need to unite behind the Green Party for the sake of having clean water and clean air for future generations. And I know that there are probably people who don't believe in climate change, but you can't, it doesn't take a scientist to know that water is necessary. It doesn't take a scientist to know 
air is necessary. Water and air are very much needed for our human survival. And if we want to make sure that we have water and air, we have to get elected officials in office who are going to take care and protect and do something about making sure we have clean water and air. And I just believe we need to stand united behind this because if we don't, divided we fall. And I don't want to fall. I don't want to fall behind having water clean water for my children and for my grandchildren. I don't want to fall behind having clean air for my children and my grandchildren. So I wanted to emphasize that the time is now. Okay, uh, I guess we're gonna take questions now. Take questions. Now, um, I'd like to ask you a more personal one. Why did you get involved with the Green Party and how has it affected you over time? And just why, what, what keeps you in it? So there was, I was at Northern Illinois as a college student and there was one person at a table and they asked me if I wanted to go to a protest. And I'm like, sure. I was in history. Um, I've already known that something was not right with the world. I actually remember being 12 years old and sitting underneath a tree with one of my friends and just thinking, the adults are not doing their job. The adults are not protecting the workers. They're not protecting our house. They're not protecting our environment. And age 12, I had what some people call in the peace movement, the aha moment. The, the, the light bulb went on and I understood at age 12 that the adults were not doing their job. And so when I got to college, I went to, uh, so I was a history, I took lots of history classes. And so my history teachers were very much um, liberal and, and um, in the peace movement. And that only spurred me more to be active. I love going to the weekly vigils. Um, I was the president of the social justice club. Uh, we did coalition group work. Um, I, I worked with them with just a small group of six people. And we had the Iraq war, we did the walkout for So we had over a thousand students walk out for the Iraq war. And I, I like to work with, with different people. I feel we're very coalition based. I feel these values are for everybody, not just the green party. Water is for everybody, air is for everybody. Um, and so I remember I had asked one of uh, the Republicans, I'm like, oh, wait, hey, you coming out, you know, against the war? And he's like, no, I don't think I, I, I can. Guess what? I saw him at the walkout and I'm like, oh, I didn't know you were coming. He goes, I got a call from Springfield. <laughs> that I, I, he got a call from Springfield that he needs to go out there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so that kind of, Set the ground groundwork for me personally for becoming uh, for being in the peace movement. Um, I kind of uh, I traveled a bit, but I protested in different states. I spent three days at uh, Yucca in Yucca Mountain um, protesting the anti nuclear uh, 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 go going there for an anti nuclear protest. So I've done many things. Um, I did work with the Democrats for a large portion from 2006 to 2019. I ran twice with them. I was kind of coming up the ranks and had a meeting in Springfield. And at that meeting, I was um, understood um, that that was not for me because I'm a power of the peace, power of the uh, people person. I, it's in my heart. It's unfortunate. It's a it's a blessing and a curse that it's my purpose. Um, but it was in that meeting that I knew I could no longer hold my peace flag up in a war party. Um, and so it took me a couple of years to find the Green Party and I did. And ever since I did, it just feels like home. It feels like my activist roots. And I'm just so proud to be able to lead this diverse team and, and to get in ballot access. And uh, hopefully we'll be doing some direct action uh, later on in the summer. So, because we need both. We definitely need both. We can't leave the ballot alone. We can't leave the streets alone.
you have to be present in both situations. Um, so that's kind of about me, about how I got involved with the Green Party. And actually, I've actually have not really been with the Green Party that long, just since 2019. So, and I've been co-chair since 2022. Now, does that take up a lot of your time, or is it just a lot of, or is it sort of like a part-time gig that consumes a lot of extra time? It takes a lot of time. Um, and actually, I do taxes as well. So I had tax season. I just got done with 55 hours. <laughs> for tax season so I'm used I'm a hard worker so <laughs> it does take time but my family knows um, sacrifices have to be made and um, my husband is such a good parent and I'm very happy to be uh, have him as a partner because he he takes care of a lot of things and I can be out out here doing doing presentations here at Gaffer's restaurant okay um now we got questions from the audience. Now, if you ladies got questions, go ahead. Here's some questions. Um, loud, 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 please, so we can hear you. Sorry, I interrupted you before. That's all um, right. Like I said, I'm a mom. <laughs> I don't know where to begin. Just, just uh, begin just, somewhere. And we can begin somewhere. We, we got time so, tonight. Well, so much you just said, we have this to do and this to do and In my mind, all we have to do right now is valid access. That's correct. Right now, through June 24th, everything else is not, yeah, we need to focus on June 24th, and then the rest of the summer we can have uh, direct action funds. Oh. Now, what do you mean by direct action? Well, then we're, so we're working with, the, the team will decide what that will be. I just got home and then came here from a direct action downtown to Palestine. Now, I have never brought my petition to any of those rallies. I've only had my petition for maybe two weeks because it took so long for me to finally get a petition that I could. I had confidence in the book and what it said exactly, and I understood it. Uh -huh. Anyway, um, I brought my petition to a and just I, people were so glad to sign. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, I don't have any materials um, from the campaign, and I hear asking for some materials from the campaign. Only thing I have is the postcard type with this great picture of Bill Stein uh, doing the sign and her holding her with the scarf, and she's at a rally for, uh, for Gaza, which is a huge concern, and it's so wonderful that she is on that track. Right, right. She wouldn't be in Europe. Right, that's, that's correct. Yeah, so. Those kinds of rallies are great places. I got 35 signatures. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like, here's one, okay, stop, 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 stop. I'm just <laughs> talking to the people who feel that we've got to win. Done. And I just need to be notarized another like 70 signatures. Yay, hey, I like that. I like that. I was also there, um, but I got there at like, 130, 140. So I got some signatures, but we were already, um, already they were already, um, mar you know, ready to march. And so I wasn't front and I didn't have my green party sign. Oh, oh, I was back towards the street. We have a friend uh, from our group, Neighbors for Peace, and we're all white okay. hair now. But uh, <laughs> uh, this particular friend, <laughs> is the carpenter cabinet maker by trade and he made a Palestinian flag measuring 17 feet by nine feet and a flag pole 30 feet high and he did the So I'll demonstrate it. Wow. Front okay. Were you near the front? No. Okay. I was near the front. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Awesome. Yeah, Absolutely. I've been protesting in Chicago um, since the early 2000s. So I'm very, um, when some of it was pre Palestine stuff too. Um, but I'm, I'm very happy we are doing something about it. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, it's a bad time and it's bad circumstances. But to me, we needed to do something like this for a very, very long time. And 
sometimes sometimes it's, it's you don't get that you that that fire underneath until it becomes personal to you and so when it becomes personal to you is when i see when it becomes personal to people is when i see them rising up and so i feel with palestine we can all we can all feel if palestine is not free then we're not free and it's all personal to everybody and everybody should be united to make sure palestine is free um, and, and we couldn't have a, a, a more reasonable Right. Underneath, you know, our weapons that we pay for with our tax dollars. And the last time it was eight hundred and ninety-two billion dollars with a B. And the time before that was still over eight hundred. And I know the time before uh, the defense war budget, there was like sixty-nine Republicans who voted no, and only like thirty-something Democrats who voted no. So to me, that's indicating that the Republicans were on the left and the Democrats were on the right. And that's not the first time that I've seen that. I've seen that with the For the People Act, which I like to call it not For the People Act, because there was four items in that bill, that Democratic bill, um, capital D Democrat, Democratic Party bill, there's four items in there that would have hurt and third parties and independents. And guess who, who put that down? The Republicans. Never ever would I have ever thought that the Republicans would have saved their parties. Okay, okay, let's okay. move on to another. Charlie, you got something? Or Jake online, we'll get back to you, don't worry. Charlie, you want to. <laughs> oh, wait, ask hold on one second. I'm going to see um, Jill Stein next week. Um, so I'm going to get campaign materials, but I do have some flyers for you to take home today. All right, Charlie, you got anything? Yeah, my question concerns Jill Stein. Why should I vote for her for president of the United States? We all need to stand united um, for the power of the people. We need a peace president. And with ballot access in 50 states, we're going to be the only party who's going to be able to do that. My question We're the viable. Party. How are you going to stop Vladimir Putin and the Chinese and these other aggressors from uh, taking over if you don't want to? If you don't want to stop, if you don't want to appease them. Similar arguments were made against Neville Chamberlain in World War II. What would happen? How do you stop them based on your Green Party philosophy? So one of the great great things about the Green Party is that we are in seventy two countries. We do have an international committee. And so people here in the United States are part of the International Committee and talking to other Green Party members in these countries um, and seeking solutions. So it's a, we're more than just this country, we're more than just the United States of America. We have an international uh, level and we can work with our Green Party counterparts in different countries and come up with the solutions. Um, Okay, who else has got a question? All right. Um, I happen to know one of the guys in um, Canada who's been opposing the Green Party stance on uh, nuclear power. His name is uh, Gordon McDowell, and he's met one of your Green Party counterparts. I think she's a national chairman in Canada. And they've actually taken a look. So what is the Green Party's position on nuclear power and why do you believe this? So I think the um, the Green Party platform uh, based on the nuclear power um, is I, I think it's mostly based. Um, if you don't know, I understand. No, I it, it, I do I do have it. It is an anti nuclear reactor position. Um, we do like to have, like, think about the next seven generations, and a generation is like 20 years, so we are thinking ahead of 140 years. Um, but this is, you know, part of individual, you know, this is part of the individual. This is, this is an anti nuclear um, group. But when this was written, 
And the nuclear reactors that are written in here, I believe, are just traditionally based off of the water-based uranium nuclear reactors. I don't know at that time that they knew of anything else. Okay, uh, Jake, I guess you're next. Go ahead and speak. Oh, uh, uh, I got a question. Um, can <laughs> is, is Jill, is, Well, I got two questions. If Jill Stein is the if Jill Stein is a candidate, do you think she can win? How many votes can she get? Um, I do think that she can win because I do believe in the in the will of the American people, and I believe that they can get behind a candidate who wants health care for all, who wants water, who wants peace, who wants clean air. So I do believe that it is very possible in 2024 that a party outside of the corporate war party can win. Uh, and well, uh, does, 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 how, how, how much money does it take to, to run a presidential campaign and how much, uh, uh, how much fundraising clout does the Green Party have? Um, I actually don't know those numbers. Our uh, Green Party U.S. representative um, traditionally has those numbers, um, but we do um, have the filings on FEC. So you can look that up. I don't know how much it, it does to take to run a presidential um, campaign, uh, but I do know our vote to dollar ratio is very low, which is good because it doesn't cost us that much to get our, to get the voters. Okay. Um, ladies, if you want to go ahead, Dan, go ahead. All right, uh, Steve, you have a question out there if you want to ask it? All right, ladies, go ahead. Ask your questions. And tax resistance. So not taxing? Is that... We don't like paying for war taxes. We want to divest from war and invest in the people. It's time for us to have some self-care. Um, we want healthcare for all. Um, we want some, uh, infrastructure. We want food security. Um, we want to be able to take care of the people and not war. So we have about $892 billion. We, so the next nine countries combined we still are spending more. And I think this is an old number, but China we had was at 77 billion and they were the next highest to us. So if we were to take $800 billion, we'll still be, we'll still have spending more than what the Chinese are and then have $800 billion for healthcare, for uh, we want the air for infrastructure. So eight hundred billion dollars is a lot of money. May I ask your stance on coffee? Um, we are not the coffee party, but I do personally like coffee. And we, I do like to remind the children um, during their drug-free week that coffee is a drug. <laughs> It's caffeine. <laughs> Old Clement the Eighth said, "This Satan's brew is so delicious and a pity to let the infidels have exclusive use of it. No, we shall baptize it until they call it a Christian beverage." Straight from Pope Clement the Eighth of the Catholic Church. <laughs> My children know I like coffee. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Charlie, you got your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, according to. One political party, specifically the Republicans, if you enact all this eco, eco, ecological legislation, it's going to be very harmful to our economy. Is that a valid argument? For, for I, not don't voting? So. I don't believe so because it keeps the current tax rates as they are just for right now. Um, and we reinvest those those 800 billion dollars into our communities. 
we're going to be able to, to train people on how to, do, to clean up water, how to clean up air. We're going to have uh, jobs for infrastructure. So it's, for the Green New Deal, we are, we are creating jobs and not just temporary six-month jobs just to make the numbers happy. Concretely, jo concrete jobs locally based that will help the community-based economics. We want strong local community. Strong local communities can have, are financially sound. They're safe. We want our we want everybody to live in a safe neighborhood. Anybody else got a question out here? Where we got it? We got an open mic, and we still got some question time. Yeah, I I got a question. Go ahead, Charlie. Looking at those photos and to past experience, it seems to me that a large number of women are members, active members of the Green Party, exceeding men. Is there any reason for that? Or uh, yeah, well, unlike I, the other parties, the other parties are portrayed as guys in a smoking room, you know. Uh, is this the antithesis of the, the party of men? Well, we welcome all genders. Um, more men can step up. I'd be fine with that. Um, so the peace movement, and, and the postmodern peace movement in the United States, kind of was from more of the radical left women's group. And so we have consensus which was used by uh, radical feminists in the 60s and the 70s. Um, and we use our decision making process based off of that consensus, which we learned from the peace movement, which was from the radical women's left group, um, which I believe that they learned from Spanish anarchists. Um, that, so we do have the consensus decision making process um, from the peace movement, we are still connected to that peace movement historically. Um, so, but we do welcome all genders. Okay. Uh, yeah. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. You got it. You, go ahead. I don't know too much more about the International Committee. It is something on my goal list, uh, personally, um, in uh, by 2026, um, to be on the International Committee. Um, I would love to learn more about that. Um, I do understand from our European counterparts that there are, uh, you know, major majorities are getting to be a majority. Um, I think the Europeans are kind of ahead of the game with us, uh, ahead of the game on the Green Party. Um, but then again, they don't have uh, politics in their uh, media. They don't have the corporations in their parties. They can actually say a third party without being shunned away. Um, sometimes I know some countries have 16 political parties. Can you imagine that here? <laughs> Um, so I think it's very comfortable for um, other countries, for European countries to be able to talk about politics and be able to be like, oh, you're from a different party, okay, and have a conversation about that rather than immediately putting up a stop, a stop sign and saying, I don't even want to think about a third party. It's only a, you know, a, a two-party system, that's it. So I think they're more comfortable talking about politics and they don't have the noise that we do. Do you think it's... Um, uh, I actually do not know about that specifically. We do like a community-based economics, but I'm not sure if it's something that um, we we are in favor for or not in favor for if it was, you know, for trade, you know, for more trade. So I would have to get back to you on that happening. 
Okay, Steve, okay. you got your hand up. We'll get to him next and then we'll go to you. Steve, go ahead. Steve, go ahead, you're up. Mr. Grossman, you're up. Steve, you're up. Maybe we can come back to Steve? Yeah, I will. All right, you wanna go? Charlie, let you go next, go ahead. I'm a little embarrassed. Yeah. Well, hold on to me, Charles is on mine. Oh, go, go ahead, Charlie. Go ahead. I was wondering, under, could you explain a little bit on ranked choice voting? And isn't it the, isn't all the candidates share the same requirements for getting on the ballot under ranked choice voting? Um, that's two issues, actually, Charles. It's ranked choice voting is one issue, and then equal ballot access is a second issue. They're not the same. Ranked choice voting is where you get to have on the ballot, there's three or six people, you get to rank them one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever is on there. Um, so what that does is the ranked choice voting makes sure, it ensures that there's majority of voters for that elected official. Let's say, for example, that there are three or four people on there. Well, if that four, if that top person has 26%, they're going to be pr probably elected, which means our that elected official is not elected by a majority of the people. And so what ranked choice voting does is oh, here's my number one, they go through all the number one. To me, it's kind of similar to a chili cook-off. You go through all your number ones. Oh, hey, they don't have a majority. Okay, let's go to your number two. Okay, they don't have a majority and go down the line. Um, and you're looking for a candidate that has a majority of the people. Imagine that. Um, so that's the bring choice voting. And then equal ballot access is where all the candidates have the same, the same time frame, the same starting time, the same petition requirements the same ending time, and it puts everybody on an equal footing, unlike the current system we have right now in Illinois to the uh, Democratic majority. Okay, um, seeing as that, woman, that woman from Alaska ran for Congress, and I believe she was claiming that she agreed to ranked choice voting, and then she didn't win the election. She claimed she was cheated. I'm What's your sure name, that woman? Her, or, you know, I'm not sure about that. Um, it could be, it sounds like a personal opinion to me. All right. Go back to you uh, ladies over here. Go ahead. Um, I'm a little embarrassed that I've never looked at this. This is typically with regard to the time and part. What about Ukraine? I'm not sure what her stance is on Ukraine. Um, for the Illinois Green Party, we do believe in the right to self-defense. What do you mean by that? Um, you mean the self-defense by the people of Lugansk and Donetsk from the Ukraine military since 2014? I'm not first on that issue. Um, I should be. Um, but um, I know it's been brought up um, time to time where yes we are nonviolent but yes we also have the right we also believe in the right to self defense. So to whom are you that right to self defense? Well that's not enough. Uh, I'm not versed on that issue. I'm sorry. I'd be more than happy to look into it and talk with people who are more versed about that to get you an answer. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, what? Uh, I'm sorry. I just. Oh, uh, Steve's coming back in. I would like to know what your stance is. Uh, have you thought about the Iran Iranian, the, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? Uh, 
and what might need to be done to solve it. Because I know that the Palestinians are having a lot of trouble, but they're being governed by Hamas right now. And, you know, when Hamas uses human shields, it's kind of hard for the Israelis to, to take them down and to, and to get rid of the, the perpetrators and the of the, of the party. You know, um, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be a pain. What do you think it's going to take to bring peace to the Palestinian people? Not just a ceasefire. Can you elaborate a little bit? Yeah, this is also something that's on an international level that I'm not completely versed on. Um, I'm more on the state level right now. Um, we do have uh, the Green Party of the United States has put out several issue statements on this. Okay. Well, locally, then, what do you think about, um, let's just say, Chicago public schools? The Green Party gets on a ballot in Cook County. What are you going to do to improve them? Um, I'm not sure what the uh, Cook County team would like to do. We like to have our chapters sovereign and autonomous. Um, I know that there um, are going to be opportunities to have uh, school boards on the ballot, school board positions on the ballot. I believe they're in probably, I think, 2025 to 2026. 2026. 2026. Yeah, so we are looking into that, and we are currently an established district in the Metropolitan Waters District. Meaning, uh, Meaning we have the lesser signature requirement for the, for the water district. For the MWRD, okay. Yep. All right, and uh, all right, Jake, do you have a question? Jake, did you have a question or not? Okay, ladies, go ahead. I'm sure you got plenty more. Okay. Um, all right. Okay, I, I got, shoot, I'm sure I could come up with a bunch more. Yeah. Um, Charlie's got another one. Go ahead, Charlie. Um, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. where does the, I'm not certain precisely, but there's various versions of the Green New Deal. Doesn't Jill Stein have her own, or what is the position of the Green Party on these Green New Deal type proposals. Okay. All right. Um, he wants to know about the Green New Deal. You have any 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 thoughts on that? Um, for the Green New Deal, so it's to create jobs and get us um turn turn the ship around. Um, focus on infrastructure, water, air, and the things that. Water and air are non-negotiable. I'm going to repeat. I'm going to repeat myself there. Um, we're going to need that. Not uh, not some issue that's hanging out there that you know you might like or might not like. We all have to get united behind clean water and clean air. Okay, so taking the clean water aspect of it, what do you think needs to be done in the Chicago metropolitan area to clean up the water more? Um. Any for I'm not sure of the specific steps that we need to do, but um, I will say we do need to educate um, our population on, and especially the younger generation, of how to clean water, how to clean air, because there are ways to do re remediation. What are they, and how do we train the next generation to do that? Because they absolutely will need to know. So as adults, it's our job to have that personal responsibility to make sure that th th that gets passed down, the education and the knowledge gets passed down because they will absolutely need that. Okay. Now, uh, this is gonna be, a, what are you most passionate about the Green Party about? What is it that drives you to keep going with the Green Party? Um, I would say the power of the people, being able to provide resources to local communities, um, 
and give them guidelines and um, helpful tips about how how do you sit in a space and be able to talk about identifying problems and coming up with solutions in a respectful manner and make sure everybody has a seat at the table and make sure everybody has their voice heard. Uh, just let them go. Kim, give me a minute. Yeah, I'm going to have to find it. out the call-in number for the College of Complex Reserve. That's Charles. Oh, no, it's on the website. I just got to go up here real quick. Um, we'll get it for you real quick. It's on the College of Complex's homepage. It's 312. <laughs> go find it. It's on the internet. Just go to the College of Complex's homepage. You'll be there. 312-626. It won't take long. We're coming. Don't worry. Three one two six two six. Three one two six two six six seven nine nine. It's right here. And you need the, the number. It's right. She doesn't have net access. It's right on the College of Complexes homepage. But I'll write it there. And you need the access number. That's right. It's 312 626 6799. And then you the need the password number, I think. Okay. And it's, it's all up there. All right, uh, it's right there, 812. Okay, uh, well, well uh, I'll show you, I'll show you online. All right, next, uh, who else is up next? I know Jake's still here, Charlie's still here, our two ladies are still here. Anybody else have any questions? Well, I guess not. Okay. Well, Wait, we have one more. Go um, ahead. I'd like to know how many locals do you have in Illinois? Um, they are in Southern Illinois and Northern Illinois, now in Central Illinois. I would say maybe a dozen or so, maybe a dozen. But we are doing our chapter affiliation reports and we're also getting some new chapter um, applications coming in. Geographic areas. It's it's um, we like to keep our our chapters um, autonomous. So we have the ten key values, and as long as every member is abiding by those ten key uh, values, just like every other U.S. Um, Green Party member and every international Green Party member, and all together. We all abide by the time key values. And I think, I don't know if you know them, but there might be some here. Yeah. I can refer to that slide for everybody online. Just so. Our 10 key values are ecological wisdom, social justice, grassroots democracy, nonviolence, Decentralization, community based economics, feminism, respect for diversity, personal and global responsibility, and future focus. Are you getting that slide? Okay, I just ahead. had to just shut your PowerPoint down okay. not too long yeah. ago. We're going we're gonna to get it back up. So every Green Party has to abide by those okay. 10 key values. Um, All right, Dale Lehman just came. Dale, how you doing? Very good. We just finished up the presentation. We're taking questions now for our and a shuffle by the Green Party member. 
you have a question for her right now, please. Do I? Yes. Yeah, what's uh, Jill's position on the role that the National Institute of Health played in uh, the cock up on dealing with the uh, pandemic, the COVID pandemic, and the role that uh, big corporations, big pharma played in shaping uh, some of the statements they had regarding how doctors would be allowed to treat patients during the pandemic, and even now. Is that something Jill takes a position on, or are you even following? I'm sorry, I really, I, it was kind of, was it breaking up a little bit? I uh, maybe it was. What he was asking about, what he was asking about was your, Jill's position on doctor-patient uh, relationships during the pandemic and how it's being held now, and if she had any stance on it. Well, I can't speak on behalf of Jill Stein. Um, I'm not part of her, um, I'm not part of uh, the direct team that is um, being briefed on, on these issues. Um, but for the Green Party in general, we do believe in healthcare for all. And I'm not sure what you mean by doctor-patient relationship during COVID. The that... National Institute of Health had issued directives to doctors about what they could use to treat their patients with. In other words, approved treatments or not approved treatments, you're talking about things like uh, with somebody who's I ivermectin or not or something like that. Yeah. So basically, and, and only recently did the Institute of Health retract its statement in a court case, claiming that they never told doctors that they couldn't practice medicine when a doctor, based on their own experience, found that, for instance, ivermectin or some other widely used drug uh, was uh, working with their patients. Okay, so Dale, let me get this straight. You're wanting to know if Jill Stein supported a doctor with the ivermectin and other treatments other than the official ones during the COVID dilemma, and if she still does now, correct? Correct, more or less. Now, I'm not sure about that answer, but if you can um, send me, if you're fine, you can send me an email at chair at ilgp.org. And when I see her and her team next week, I'll ask her now and I can get back to you. She, she, she will get back to you. Okay. It's right. the issue of, of big corporations taking over public health and driving it for their particular interest in, at the expense of the practice of medicine, which is not a straightforward it's kind of an art you know based on communication between doctors etc and patients not just top-down bureaucrats deciding what's best for everybody okay we will have a rebuttal period in a few minutes dale after we finish our okay period which means got it we'll give you guys a certain amount of time to uh do it normally our format is we have uh, yeah I'm... go ahead charlie Go ahead, yeah, I, I believe the larger issue, and I believe uh, Madam State Chair has been advocating health care as an issue. I think the primary concern is that a significant number of people in the United States cannot afford to see a doctor of any type or get any advice at all. And I believe that was the issue she was promoting. And it's a serious one, is that we still have a, a problem in that the people can't afford very basic health care of any kind. Now, uh, to the extent that's under corporate control, I don't know. But I believe we are right back where we started, and that most people... I put off or do not ever make doctor's appointments for the simple fact they can't afford it. I think in my own experience, an uninsured person who makes an appointment to see a doctor would face a charge of something like $250. Now, there are various other clinics and so forth, but the real issue here 
And the one I think we this should maybe I'm wrong, should we focus on is that the thing now the government also we're making various treatments free. Um you could choose to elect them or not. Now whether or not we're getting ripped off, I don't know. But anyhow, what are your feelings on on providing health care for the people, Madam Chair? Yeah. Um, so we do, and one of our coalition members is the Illinois Single Single Payer um, Coalition. Um, and healthcare for all is a very what we call centrist policy, which means a majority of the people want it. The last time I checked, it was 67% of the people, the majority of Americans, want healthcare for all. My question is, how come Congress is not voting? 67% for healthcare for all. And when we have that $800 billion uh, that we can divest from more, we can use some of that money to invest in healthcare for all. And for me personally, I would also like to see healthcare for all for our veterans. Because the VA system in rural, in rural areas is not very good and the veterans have to travel far from my understanding. <laughs> just to seek good, adequate access for, to doctors. Now, if we have healthcare for all, we can, we can self-care for the American people um, and we can treat our veterans better. And with that being a, a centrist policy, a 67% of the majority of Americans want it, I think we should get it, but the only way we're going to get it is if we have health care for all candidates on the ballot. And the, the majority of the corporate war party candidates are not for health care for all. So again, the Green Party is a viable option to have health care for all. So, and I have a, I put, um, a link out to our platform on, on there, it's 46 pages. And not everybody always agrees with everything in that platform. Um, so it's not, so I know that there might be some concerns about the Green Party, but by and large, we are getting about, we're, we're, on, the, we're on track to get ballot access in 50 states. We're healthcare for all, we're pro-peace, we're pro-worker. These are all boxes a lot of people wanna see checked off. And they're not gonna get that with the corporate war, war party. You can speak there. Well, there's a piece. How can you possibly uh, not take a position on the fact that we are spending money, our, our military budget is some $840 billion, and we are spending on top of that well more than $100 billion to fund the Ukraine war. I've never said that I was justifying the war on Ukraine. No, what do you mean the war on Ukraine? I mean, I was never, I was never, I made no comments about that, the Ukraine war. Yeah, I've never made any comments about that. I not burst in international relations at this time. So what I was saying is we believe in nonviolence. Does anybody know? Two people on the phone. Does anybody know? Were those three people that the voted on today? Ukrainian Joe. Yes. Ukrainian Ted. Yes. Well, what about Taiwan? What about Israel? No, today they were they were going to vote on two separate bills. So. They passed. Oh, they passed. All three of them passed, and it's now going to the Senate for next Tuesday when they uh, do the supplemental funding for the Ukrainian and Israeli armies, plus another $8 billion to uh, Taiwan and its affiliates. And they're just, they're just giving away our money that we need for ourselves. And I don't mean to sound protectionist, like a protectionist, but we need healthcare. We need infrastructure.
structure. We mm -hmm. need to make sure water and air are here. We have mm -hmm. needs. And they're not, I, my, me personally, they're not being met by our current Congress people. Right. Okay. Um, any other questions out there? I think it happens. Talked about the three or four and how so much money um, refurbishing and how, how oh. they talk about Okay. Yeah. So we'll we are. Dale, we'll get you next, okay? We are. Um, we do have a chance of anti nutrients and um, also to deface um, out of the coal plants in Illinois as well. There are, we have about 20, I think it was 25% of the nuclear reactors here in Illinois within like a 50 mile radius. Um, and this is actually something that in my early activist years, I actually came through the anti-nuclear movement and the peace, in the peace movement, I was very much tied to them. Um, and I would like to be more tied to them. Um, what had got me was how can we protect this radioactive waste for a hundred thousand years, a hundred thousand years, I never wrap my mind around the fact of how we can take care of this. Um, so with that, I, you know, we do believe in the anti-nuclear um, positions, um, and, there, and we do know that there are some, you know, things that with ComEd, um, and so we are in a we do understand that solar and wind are the easiest and the cheapest to put up right now. I'm talking about the new We do believe in a collective peace. And so in that collective peace, we want everybody to be able to feel safe, and with that nuclear threat, we need we need to make sure that that is um, obsolete. Okay, Dale, you got a question or not, Jen? Yes. Uh, what uh, has Jill said about how she would structure or staff her uh, State Department? Currently, uh, uh, Biden's State Department is filled with neocons like Victoria Nuland and, and and the rest of them, and uh, they were responsible uh, two administrations back for initiating a coup in Ukraine that led to the civil war that uh, is still being fought now, and that money is being sent for sent to sustain by the United States. Uh, would she, does she have in mind people that uh, she would put into the State Department who are not neocons, not uh, not committed to uh, foreign policy based on war? Uh, do you have a response or do you know anything about uh, that? Or what about the Green Party? I mean, the US is, on a war, in a war economy. It's been in one for some time now. What would be the policy changes that uh, would take back control of the economy and put it to the benefit of civilian needs? So I can't speak on behalf of Jill Stein's campaign or what her thoughts are about the State Department, but what I can say is that with the Green New Deal, we'd be creating locally local jobs um, for infrastructure, for energy, and get this ship turned around. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, you ladies have any more questions? If not, we're going to move to the rebuttal section of our thing, which means you'll each get a certain specified amount of time. I'm gonna set that at about uh, five minutes, maybe six minutes each. So if you ladies wanna get up there and uh, Charlie, that goes for you too, or anybody online, um, let's go to rebuttals. And uh, why don't one of you gals go up first and uh, take no, about- been... Let's thank our speaker. Okay. Thank you. You got a rebuttal back? Uh, 
You got a rebuttal? Okay, I guess I go first. I'll, I'll allot myself the amount of time I consume, which is probably going to be less than five minutes. I, too, support the practices and premises of what the Green Party is for. But I also know, too, that, you know, you're not going to stop war. You're not going to be able to stop a lot of this stuff. And I just don't know how in the heck we're going to do it. I do know that we did achieve a peace after World War II with the utter destruction of the uh, Nazi Germany Empire, only again to uh, face off the communist empire. And then that died in 1991. And we did certainly did not do a good job of uh, representing ourselves in, in globalization or trade afterwards. We've now allowed the rise of a dictator called Vladimir Putin who did invade Ukraine. We have also uh, Xi Jinping in China, who so far has been wanting to rise. There are indications that uh, he wants to invade Taiwan. The world today is basically uh, a three power system. The first is going to be the United States is going to be the one that provides a guarantor of security around the world because we are the largest military and we are the largest thing, and we're going to have to keep that way for some time to preserve the security of the world. The second part is the uh, basic governance around the world is going to be through the nation states of, you know, us, the Western world, the European Union, Russia, China, and possibly even um, India rising. Um, the third part, which most people don't quite understand, is that Right now, there's a big shift taking place to the large tech companies, Facebook, Google, other people that have been getting a lot of power due to the rise of the internet, the rise of artificial intelligence and the power of social media over time. And that's where a lot of your political power is gonna come from. So we not only have to worry about, you know, nation states and uh, large, corporations and interests, but also now the rise of the tech companies. However, can we do anything to solve these problems? Well, I think there is a solution. And a lot of that has to go back to what is it in the human heart that causes all these peace, peace and troubles in the first place. I mean, nobody today, even with our advanced technology, our governing systems, our our ways of uh, doing things that solve the problem of the human heart and the evil and the good that can arise from within it. You know, what is it that causes wars amongst you but not the inequality that you've seen? What is it in the human heart that causes you to uh, covet your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's goods? Well, I honestly think that, that problem Sure. It will be solved by uh, acknowledging our creator. I know I've said this before and I'll say it again. I, in my own life, uh, I've had a lot of, you know, and I still do have those same tendencies. For years, uh, the Christian faith has called it sin. Other faiths have called it the evil desires. Other faiths have done it, but I have not yet seen a welcome plan or political movement that can cure that one problem. I and uh, people like Billy Grant have talked about this for years, um, saying that, you know, what is it that's gonna cause us? Well, I think a lot of it is because we have rebelled against our creator. We are all self-serving individuals and we all have the capacity for good and evil. But I honestly think that God wants us to choose which way we wanna go, which, field we're going to fi follow what we do with our own lives. And the thing is, most people don't have the eternal in their heart. They only go with the short term. They don't think of what the long term things are going to be. Now, like for me, for example, when I look at climate change, I simply do not think 
that renewables or, or something are going to cut it because it's not going to be enough power. But I also do believe that nuclear may be the way to go. Not the large things we have today, but small modular reactors of a thorium-based molten salt design. Why do I believe it? Because one of the very inventors, a guy by the name of Alvin Weinberg, who was the director of Oak Ridge National Laboratories in the 1960s, knew that the, of the problems with these large-scale reactors. In the, 1973, a congressman by the name of Chet Holyfield said, well, if you don't believe in nuclear power, why are you running it? And he was fired as, a, as the uh, head of Oak Ridge. But he did something about it for 6,000 hours in the 1960s. He ran a safe reactor that was of a molten salt design, which basically would uh, yield a lot more power from uranium and thorium and had, the, had had the advantages of burning off the long-term actinides, the 300,000, 400,000, 200,000 year radioactive, radioactive stockpiles, because they are in there. And a lot of the waste that we have today can be recycled, reused. Um, well, it can be also be made of bomb material, but you know, that's where we're gonna have to have regulation. The nuclear genie is out of the bottle. And anybody can right now go on plans on the internet and even make a suitcase nuke if they had access to the material. Which is one of the reasons that Alvin Weinberg said, if we use this, we're gonna to have to get accustomed to institutions that are long formed and long running. But I honestly think that if we want to maintain a world's advanced industrial society with healthcare, with AI, with uh, a lot of the stuff that you guys are talking about, it's going to require a lot more power than what we can do. And that's just one of the areas. But when I get back to what's really holding society back, I think it is us. I think it is us that when we say, for example, that we're going to be corrupt within our own system, and I could mean anything from cheating on your taxes to lying to your spouse or, or lying to somebody else, that's where the fundamental flaw of society reigns. I myself am a Christian. I believe in the saving re redemption of Jesus Christ. And I'll be going to two churches tomorrow, Protestant and taking my mom to the Catholic. But I really believe that's where we're going to find the solution to our stuff. So I like in church? He does. I haven't been to church in 10 years. Charlie, you're going to get your chance to rebut me next. But anyway, I've said what I had to say. I'm not going to church. And I've uh, said what I needed to do. I applaud your efforts. I think it'll be good to get another voice in there and it will take work. But just remember who you're working for, what are you doing, and know your know your stuff. It's an able, it's an able goal to do this stuff. Just like it's an able goal for me to keep this forum running all the time. Anyway, who's next on the rebuttal? Charlie, you want to go next? All right, I'll go. I first of all I'd like to thank our speaker. She puts a lot of time and energy as a as a member of the Green Party since its inception at a national level, dating back to 1980. I've been in a, a, a Green, a Chicago Green. But she puts a lot of time and effort and energy into this organizing effort. Now, there's one thing I'd like to point out to everyone that they may not realize. I've had plenty of experience with the established parties. In order to run for office under the established parties, you have to make a contribution in order to run in a particular seat. It's, you almost have to buy the, the candidacy. Now, what does it do if you are an independent and you can't afford their price tag? to run for a particular office. And there's a running for office on the established parties is not the purest process in town, the selection process. But if you want to run for independent, it's a complex process. I'm sorry. There are rules and regulations on petition drives and submission of these and challenges and requiring financial reporting systems like you wouldn't believe. If you want to run for office, you can do it on your own. 
but you probably would have to hire someone with a considerable salary to conduct the campaign. We have someone at the college whose son, son's occupation is in fact that he takes on positions and serves as a campaign manager of people that can afford it. I mean, it is an occupation and a regular position and a job. Now, the one thing the Green Party does is you can run for office and the Green Party will offer you advice every step of the way, from advertising to printing to the filing forms to the petitioning and the taking on challenges. The Green Party, in particular in Illinois, has a depth of experience that will ensure that, if anything, you will meet the basic requirements of running for office. Now, this doesn't mean necessarily you're going to win or get a lot of votes, but your hat's going to be, your name's going to be on the ballot. And whether you win or lose is a whole different set of variables. But you will have guidance and assistance to the fullest extent possible for you to meet the minimal technical requirements to be recognized as a candidate. And that's a lot, let me tell you. You really, really need someone with some background and experience to assist you in navigating through the election process. You can do it on your own and contract out, so to speak, uh, for personnel to do it for you. Anybody thinking that they can do that on their own, I simply don't think that's feasible. You need someone with experience. I mean, there are so many ways campaigns are disqualified for various things simply by virtue of not knowing the complications of the process. Now, we're coming up with some programs on voter suppression, and there's also things candidate suppression. Believe you me, there are other, other parties out there that will do anything and everything to keep anyone from competing with them for the votes. They're out there, and they will exercise, whether it's legal or not, they're, what they feel is an opportunity to disqualify you as a candidate. Are you prepared to deal with that? You need some sort of apparatus of experienced campaign people to back you up. And that's the one thing you're going to get from the Green Party. I've seen this over and over again. They've managed to do pretty good without any corporate real structure to run viable this year because are you running a viable campaign? Or is it just a feel-good kind of thing? But the key to the whole thing is to run a viable campaign. Well, I might serve as an endorse on several endorsement committees. And the first thing people don't realize is we look at does this person as they put together a viable goal, a viable campaign. The Green Party will make that possible. Anyhow, thanks for coming tonight. And let's all join the Green Party and get further involved. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know what happened to our guy. Looks like we got dis disconnected. Thanks, Charles. Yeah, how you doing? All right. Uh, I hoped to hear more about uh, uh, the candidates' positions, but uh, I guess it is what it is. So, well, you got to look at their platforms. There you go. Like she said, you missed it. The yeah. Illinois Green Party platform is forty-six pages. 
Yeah. You know, so you can you can find stuff in there, you know. Okay. Well, I'll take a look. You take yeah. care. Yeah, you too. No, it costs you though. Okay, Charlie, sorry about that. We lost connection. Charlie, are you still there? Yeah, we lost some people too. All right. Um, well, that's what happened. I don't know what it. Okay, why don't you uh, make your final remarks? It looks like we're going to be wrapping up. I'm sorry about all the trouble, Charlie. Can everybody come back on? Well, yeah, we had two of them while we had. Hang on a minute here. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, so I wanted to, to thank you, Tim, for keeping this College of Complexes uh, going uh, so we can have a free speech forum. Um, I, I'm glad that you also feel there's some merit, if I'm not, you know, being uh, uh, putting words in your mouth uh, to the Green Party. Um, and I do like the team that we have now. We have a very diverse team. We have people from different religions, we have people from different socioeconomic backgrounds, demographics, uh, we have people all over the state. So I'm very happy that the team is there, we're strong, and that we can accomplish this goal of the 50,000 signatures we have done it before. I hope we can just do it again um, and get a those voter, get another person on the ballot, but not just another person, a person who's going to fight for health care for all, a person who's going to fight for divesting in war, a person who's going to try to get us out of this, this nuclear threat. Uh, and it's for good governance. It's not for a lesser of two evils. It was both of them having corporate war parties. It's just not an option. And it's not an option for me. It's not an option for, for, for many others. And to be perfectly frank, it's not an option for the future. Um, so I do like working with this diverse team. I like being part of a national organization. I'm looking forward to being part of more of the international um, community within the Green Party. Um, I myself just became a Green in 2019, so I'm still learning the ropes in regards to national and international relations. Um, um, and so I've been focused a lot on the state of Illinois. Uh, and making teams, making strong teams, making sure that our local communities have the ability to identify uh, problems and come up with solutions. Um, and Charles mentioned, you know, running for office. When I'm now talking to other states, I 
I even am more thankful for the, the Illinois Green Party team because we can say, hey, go to Lego, hey, go to West, hey, go see this person. And a lot of other states, they don't have that. They don't have a great team, a great devoted team to be like, hey, we got you. you um, we have decades of people who are in the Green Party, we have decades of experience um, in the state of Illinois. So I'm very thankful that we have that, that we have such a strong team that we can put things together and have make a difference and make that change. Because if you just say it's never going to happen or have a negative attitude about it, as I tell my children, not with that attitude. You can't make change with an, if we just go in there and be like, nothing's going to change. There's no reason to do anything. Well, guess what? That's your attitude already. It's not going to get changed. But if you have to go in with a strong team and a positive attitude, let's get this done. It's time. It's 2024. It's past time. And you all have to look at the future focus. Are we going to have clean water? Are we going to have clean air? These are non-negotiable items. We have to have it. We have to unite together right now in 2024 to ensure that we are going to have clean water. We are going to have clean air. We need health care for all. And we need to make sure that everybody is going to feel safe. Okay. Why don't you just go ahead and adjourn us out then, and we'll call that a night. All right. Thank you. Turn us out. All right, everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. I know it was a light turnout, but... I do appreciate it.